My guest today is Danielle Walker. How are you, Danielle? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing really well. It's a beautiful thanks day for here having in me. Chicago. Oh, thanks for coming. And you're in Denver, right? I am in Denver, yes. Uh, Denver's one of my favorite cities. I love the skyline there. Oh, yeah. It's, it's great. And it's really nice out today. So can't what complain. Do you, what do you do in Denver? Uh, so I am director of product delivery for a um, global um, software development agency called Ken and Carta. And so we work um, in various different verticals with you know, different clients from startup to enterprise. And essentially, you know, my job is to define what we're building, when and why, and communicate the product vision uh, and help people build software. Nice. So we're working with tech companies to help them uh, resell technology. Is that the yeah, idea? Yeah, exactly. And, and, yeah. and tech services. Um, and a lot of these are startups. Yeah, so um, I have worked with quite a few startups. Um, I think now we're a little bit more into mid-level to enterprise range, but um, it, you know, for the majority of my career here, I've, I've been working with startups. Every once in a while, I think about starting a tech company because I've been a technologist for a long time, but it seems hard. It seems like uh, there's a lot of people that try it and they don't succeed. Is that and what's your experience? Is it, um, is it do you just have to have, be smart and have a good product, or is it, is it more to it? <laughs> I think being smart and having a good product helps. I yeah. think. Is it um, enough, though? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> I don't know if it's enough. I think, you know, consistency, having a good um, plan at the beginning, I think investing in the right things. Uh, helps. And by that, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of noise out there about, you know, where you should be spending your money and what you should be investing in, uh, what the most important thing is. And I think that, um, a lot of times founders, especially just get really, um, you know, th they put the blinders on and they're really focused on, you know, their product and they love their product so much and they think it's a great idea and they don't take time to validate a lot of their ideas and assumptions. And I think that can be where some of the mistakes are made or, um, you know, I don't know if that contributes to them not failing, I guess, in, in, in their startup, but I, I think that that's one of the things that can contribute to it. Well, what I really want to talk to you about is uh, what are the things that um, if I'm if I'm a technologist, I've got a product or a service that I want to build, what are the things that I can do right? And what are the things I can avoid to be more successful, to, to increase my chances of success? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think, you know, when it comes to your tech, a lot of things that I see with founders is, um, you know, they're, they're trying to save money. They don't, you know, they want to make sure that they're getting their the most bang for their buck because Makes sense. it's important. <laughs> And uh, so I think one of the things that they tend to do is rely on tech experts, tech leads, uh, software developers to they, they rely on them too heavily. And they mm -hmm. think that that is a replacement for good product, good requirements, validating assumptions. So uh, I would say, you know, make sure that you're investing in a product manager, you're investing in your product and not expecting that the tech side will be a replacement for a good product itself. Um, so if you're, um, even though your product is uh, based on technology, the product manager might not necessarily be a technologist. So and ideally okay. you would, yeah, I mean, you'd want a product manager who knows tech and is, um, a technologist, but not someone who's necessarily coding or knows the back end architecture, doing actual software development. You want to have someone who is a voice for the product uh, mm -hmm. and not just someone who's coding for you. Okay, so you can look at the big picture as opposed to the, the myopia that a lot of software developers kind of get into. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's good advice. What, uh, keep going. What else? 
so one of the mistakes that I've seen is that that goes into this and a good product manager can help you, you know, suss out and kind of figure out what a good feature is, is overloading your product with features. So um, frequently I've mm -hmm. seen, you know, startup founders go to a conference and they talk to someone and or they talk to a group of people and, you know, one person comes up and says, you know, it would be great if your software did this and it would be, I think the, this button here should be blue instead of green. And I think that you should do this. Have you ever thought about doing this? And so they have, you know, this very, very small sample size of one individual who's saying one thing and they're like, let's put that feature in and let's put this feature in uh, and thinking that overloading it with features will make it the best product. And, you know, that doesn't, you don't want to you don't want a software or a platform or an application that's too feature heavy. You really want to give people one thing that will solve their problem, uh, get it to market, see how people react to it, and then build from there. Why is it a problem if um, I have the one feature that everybody needs, and then maybe these twenty other features? Is that are those twenty other features actually a problem, or are they just a waste of time? Uh, I think. I think it can be either either way. You know, sometimes you overload a product with so many features that your users are confused. They don't know, you know, what they're supposed to be doing or there's just so many buttons that it's overwhelming and they can't get in to do the one thing that they came there to do. Uh, so I think in that case, it can be, you know, that can be a problem. Uh, sometimes you're giving great features, but you're you're not investing in the one thing or, you know, what your main vision is, what, what you really want your product to achieve the problem that you're looking to solve. And so I think that um, in that case, it can be better to invest money in getting it out the door, getting that feedback from people, and then iterating on future features based on what um, your users are asking for, what problems they actually want to solve. Yeah, I hear that. I, I've always thought one of the great user interfaces of all time was Google.com, which consists of a text box and a button that says search. And it's so intuitive. You just type it in the words and click search and you're there. And yeah, occasionally there'll be other things, cartoons and things like that. But the core feature, it's just obvious what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, it's right. It's right there. It's simple. You can get in and out. You know what you, know what you need to do right there. And you know, that I, th I think that's really important. Yeah, it's a powerful feature as well. Um, one of the things that I, I've noticed is uh, I get, uh, I do a lot of software development and sometimes I fall in love with a feature and I'm just convinced that everybody's going to love the same feature because I love it. And, uh, and then I release the software and nobody uses this amazing feature that I built into it. It's really disappointing that I spend so much time on it. Yeah. I imagine I, I think you're a, you're like a lot of founders in that way is they fall in love with their product and they fall in love with their features and think that that's going to be the one thing that users are going to love. And, and to your point, they release it out into the wild and no one cares about it or, um, you know, people hate it or they're focused or they're like, yeah, this one's OK, but this other feature is great. Yeah. And so that's another thing, you know, people aren't. Um, they're skipping the user research. They think they they think they know or understand what their users want and need. And so, you know, again, they get those blinders on and we recommend doing user research. And they're like, no, no, I've already talked to my users. I already know what they want um, without actually doing a method of user research. You know, there's there's a reason why product companies or why my company has a team of user researchers that go out there and look at what someone's doing in the field or ask them questions and, you know, eliminate bias out of their research. And that really helps them find uh, what users' pain points are. And I think a lot of times founders are kind of on the right track. They know generally what the pain points are, but sometimes they're completely blindsided by what a user says or, you know, it's in the same path, but it's something completely different than what they thought it was. And so it's really um, important to validate your assumptions before sending something out in the wild. And once it is in the wild, then continuing to validate those assumptions and getting feedback on your product so that um, you know you're you're solving you're solving your users' problems for them. What's a good way to uh, elicit 
the, the, the honest feedback from our users and from our potential users. Yeah. Um, that's is a tough one. Is it uh, beta testers? Is it uh, getting people in a room and, and just talking to them or um, going out on the streets and asking surveys? Yeah, so I think it's a combination and then aggregating that data and seeing where the commonalities lie between the surveys, A-B testing, and um, user interviews with beta testers. Um, I think it's really important to remember that, especially if you're the founder, people don't want to disappoint you. You know, they'll, they'll tell you what you want to hear and they right. don't want to, uh, you know, it's even if we're consciously trying to give the best feedback and be really candid with it, you know, there there is a bias to not wanting to disappoint someone. And so uh, that's why I think it's important to have someone who's neutral or, who's agnostic of the product and saying, I'm just coming here to find out the best information. Um, you know, I just want to hear all of your thoughts. I think that's really great. A great person to have kind of an independent party in the user research to make sure that they're there to hear what the user wants. And then you have that common or that that pairing between ux and product to really speak and be the voice of the user and it's developed and it has some key features i know users want how, how do i get the word out so i can actually make money on it yeah um you again you'd probably want to do some research into marketing unfortunately i'm not a super expert on marketing oh unfair but, question let's move on oh no that's <laughs> we'll get, I, go ahead uh I mean, I think you just want to get it out into market and get people's feedback and, and, you know, find, you know, whether that's asking a group of people to be your beta testers, you know, people that you know, that would use your product. Generally, you're, uh, if you're founding a product, you're solving a problem that of people who, you know, you know, you didn't just get this idea of like, I'm going to solve this product for this group of people that I've never interacted with. Uh, so you want to, you want to lean on your community and, and release it and then start getting the word out through them. Uh, so now, now your role, uh, when you're talking to entrepreneurs, are you helping them at the very early stages or are you helping them all through the life cycle? Uh, it depends. Sometimes we're helping them very through the very early stages, greenfield discovery, uh, doing that user research, getting an MVP out to market. Sometimes MVP they come in. MVP is oh, minimum viable product. Okay. Um, so we're helping them get you know that very first iteration of their app out into the market. Sometimes you know they've they've already got it out to market. Uh, they've got some really good feedback from their users, and now they just want someone to kind of take it to the next level and um, work on work on improving architecture or improving features or building upon the features that they already have. And then sometimes we are with them th also through once they release it, once they release these new features, we're doing continuous releases and we're getting feedback from their users on those continuous releases as well. Yeah, some, tell me about some of the mistakes that people have made that you've been able to correct. Um, good question. Trying to think how to diplomatically <laughs> answer that one. So sometimes, you know, going back to the loading a an app up with too many features, they didn't invest in product or research at the beginning. And they just said, hey, I know what the features are. I know what the app needs to do. I'm going to hire this dev team and I'm going to have them build it and get it out to market, which which can be a really good way to get that feedback early on. Uh, but generally, when we come in, it's too overloaded with features. They're not getting, you know, their tech isn't in a great spot architecturally from a code perspective. Uh, and then we kind of have to come in and play a little bit of cleanup. And so at that point, then we come in and we ask users, all right, what's frustrating about this? And a lot of times it's like, well, half of the functionality doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. And so then we, you know, that's the most frustrating thing. Okay, let's get the functionality, the core functionality working. Let's, um, you know, get it to a good place. And then we can re-release it with these improvements. And then again, we can go from there 
and figure out how your users are adapting to those new features or now that they've been improved or now that they actually work, now we can see how users are reacting to it. Yeah, and I think that answers the, 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 the what's the problem with having those 20 other features? And the problem is that you're spending time, the right. time that could be better spent in perfecting the features that, that, that the users want, eliminating the bugs, making it more intuitive, make it easier to use and all that sort of thing. Exactly. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, we're in early 2021 and uh, we're coming out of a pandemic and the economy has just been crazy for the last years. Uh, uh, is this a good time to start a tech business? <laughs> in your opinion? Oh, man. Uh, I mean, it seems like tech is booming. I'm not an economist and I'm not... <laughs> Well, you're but you're working with but, a lot of entrepreneurs, and, and are they? Is it easier this year than it was, say, two years ago? Probably, yeah, I think so. I think, uh, I think, you know, I think that people are realizing that things can change in a week. You know, in 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 any moment, anything can change, and so I think. Um, this is kind of a cliche way to answer that question, but the best time to start is now, you know, if you have an idea, go start validating it, get it out in the market. Um, you know, even if it's just like a simple web form mm -hmm. and you're just sending it out to people just to see if they would be interested in it, start, you know, mm -hmm. um, fortune favors the bold and, okay. you know, people, are really open to new ideas right now, I think, and looking for new things that will solve their problems. And so, you know, I think I think the best time to start is now. <laughs> you know? Okay. So what I'm hearing is there really isn't a bad time to start up a new business, at least in the tech sector where you can get things out quickly. For, yeah, in my in my point of view, yes. <laughs> Maybe well, if you talk more... to an economist, they would tell you differently. Uh, you know what? Economists are great, but they are they don't have the real-world experience that you have. You, you're actually out there talking to folks who are starting businesses, and some of them are succeeding and some of them are not. And uh, so I've, I would actually value your opinion over these ivory tower guys. <laughs> All right. I love that. Well, thank you. <laughs> Is there anything that we haven't talked about that we should have? Uh, no, I think I think we covered it all. Excellent. Well, Danielle, I really appreciate appreciate your time and I hope you stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was great talking to you and you had great questions. Thank you. Technology is one of the best ways to find new friends, bring friends together, especially in this pandemic, maybe post-pandemic world. Uh, so thank you very much, friends. <laughs>